Welcome to everybody to the Apex Town Council meeting. This is the scheduled meeting of time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to conduct the business of the town, to represent the citizens, and to do the things that we do to make our quality of life better in Apex. We pray that at this time you'll give us the guidance and the wisdom that, that you feel necessary for us to make uh, the smart decisions. We pray for those who are fighting overseas, whether they be um, helping other countries or fighting for our freedom here in America. And we also thank you for those who have made the sacrifice of their uh, health or life uh, on our behalf. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. A uh, couple of housekeeping issues that I usually handle uh, early on. If you missed an agenda from the podium out there, feel free to step out right now and pick one up. Uh, there's also a yellow sheet for public speaking guideline policy. So if you intend to speak tonight, there are two things you need to know. One is that yellow sheet tells you the policy, the guidelines for how to do that. So you can be familiarizing yourself with that for the next few minutes. The other is your name needs to be on one of these yellow sheets on the ledge here. So if you have not signed up for the thing that you intend to speak, and they're numbered, so make sure you sign up for the correct one, come do that now and go get your sheet out there. Uh, feel free to do that at this time if you need to. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, begin our presentations and uh, to introduce our speaker for the first presentation here, we have our finance director, Vance Holloman. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, this evening, we're very fortunate to have with us Ms. Uh, Bernina Demery, who is the Director of Financial Services for the City of Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, Bernita has been there for, uh, since 1989, and she has approximately 30 years' experience in local government finance. Uh, she is a CPA, has her uh, Master's in Business Administration from East Carolina University, and uh, tonight she is here in her capacity as a state representative of the Governmental Finance Officers Association. Good evening. Good evening. It is an honor to be before you tonight to present on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. The Government Finance Officers Association established the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting in 1945 to encourage and assist state and local governments to go beyond the minimum requirements to present comprehensive financial reports with 10 years of statistical data that ensures that readers have reliable information for decision making. And where would more decisions be made about the town of Apex than right here? In this program, um, the report was submitted to the CAFA program and reviewed by GFOA Reviewer Special Committee comprised of public sector financial reporting experts, financial statement preparers, independent auditors, and academic and other finance professionals. The government that participates in the Certificate of Achievement are asked to submit their reports within six months of fiscal year end and undergo this extensive GFOA review process. The program results are for the comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended um, 2016. And so with that, would you, Mr. Vance Holloman and Ms. Suzanne Parmenter, um, 
Mr. Holloman, as you know, is the finance officer, and Ms. Suzanne is the accounting and budget manager. So on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association, I present to you the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Finance in Financial Reporting to the town of Apex, but as a result of your hard work for its comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2016, Jeffrey Esser, Exec Executive Director and CEO. Congratulations. <laughs> Sure. Uh, I want to uh, first thank the council and management for their support for us in these efforts. It would not be possible without that. Suzanne uh, just does, uh, I'm just up here, and around. Suzanne <laughs> does just uh, so much work on this and does such a great job and uh, makes it possible. It wouldn't be possible without her and her efforts. And uh, town staff throughout every department, really, it's not just the finance department, but every department contributes to the audit and to the uh, comprehensive annual financial reports. Uh, it's really a town-wide effort and just uh, just want to thank everyone for, for their work. Thank you. All right. And certainly that's a great achievement. Um, and uh, as someone who's uh, elected, and I think I can speak for the council members, we're always very cognizant and proud to know that our town's finances are in good order because we know not all municipalities in this country uh, have that. So thank you very much. Uh, for, for presentation number two, uh, Chief John Letney and Mr. Travis Parrish uh, have a presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, Mr. Manager, staff, citizens. We're here before you tonight to accept our second accreditation award from the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. We began this journey many years ago when then Chief Jack Lewis had the vision to prepare the department to be accredited. We underwent our first assessment and earned our initial accreditation in 2014. Since then, we've maintained compliance with the standards and were assessed earlier this year. I'd like to introduce uh, our CLIA representative, the Director of Client Services, Travis Parrish. As Director, Mr. Parrish's primary responsibility is to ensure positive client engagement and, and the accreditation success for the CLIA program. Working with seven regional program managers, Mr. Parrish and the RPM team educate agencies on the value of CLIA accreditation, while also working with CLIA client agencies to achieve and maintain their CLIA accredited status. Travis is a long-standing member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, where he serves as a member of the Community Policing Committee and is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Mr. Parrish. Thank you, Chief. Mayor, Council Members, APEX residents and guests, on behalf of the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, the Commission Chair, Richard Myers, and Executive Director, Mr. Craig Hartley, CLIA is honored to be here recognizing your Protectors of the Peak. To provide a little background, CLIA was created in 1979 when the founding organizations, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Executives, the National Sheriff's Associ Association, and the Police Executive Research Forum, recognized the need within the law enforcement community to develop professional standards to enhance the delivery of police services to citizens throughout the community they serve. Since its inception, CALEA has accredited agencies under standards developed by many of the top public safety practitioners and leaders of our time. The standards are reviewed continuously to ensure, to ensure each is current and remains relevant. These standards cover a wide range of administrative, operational, and logistical issues and serve as a modern management model that provides the framework for recognizing professional excellence within public safety. In a time when public safety is being scrutinized, the APEX community leaders and citizens should take comfort in the fact that its police department has voluntarily committed to operating at a higher level and under a set of nearly 500 rigorous standards. The goals of CALEA are to strengthen crime prevention and control capabilities, 
formalize essential management procedures, establish fair and non-discriminatory personnel practices, improve service delivery, solidify interagency cooperation and coordination, and increase community and staff confidence in the agency. Based on the goals and mission statement of CALEA, I can think of no better time or place to present this accreditation certificate to the agency than at a public meeting, where all can share and recognize the hard work this agency has committed to remaining accredited. The certificate itself is simply a matted piece of paper within a frame, but it has much broader symbolic meaning. The certificate clearly represents the agency's efforts to achieve accredited status, thereby demonstrating its willingness to change in order to effectively address contemporary public safety concerns. It represents a commitment to doing the right thing and doing it the right way. Lastly, it represents an ongoing dedication to ensuring the agency's resources are appropriately developed, effectively deployed, and constantly managed, all in the name of a safer community for workers, visitors, and customers. In March of this year, CALEA assessors visited the Apex Police Department and reviewed the agency's applicable files, activities, functional impacts, and management strategies. During the agency's open comment period, several peer agencies and community leaders submitted extremely positive comments regarding the agency's professionalism and exceptional leadership. I'd like to share some words from the assessor's final report. The Apex Police Department is providing a high level of service to the community it serves. This excellence was reflected not just through file review, but through the actions of the agency, personnel, and the support of the citizens. The agency has achieved widespread support for the CALEA process demonstrated by the cooperativeness of all staff members and personnel of the agency with the assessment team. All interactions with agency employees were positive and the assessment team found the agent agency to be professional in all respects in the performance of their duties. At the commission meeting held in Providence, Rhode Island, July 29, 2017, CALEA commissioners reviewed the assessor's report concurred with their findings, and unanimously voted to re-accredit Apex Police Department. At this time, sir, I'd like to present the, uh, the certificate to Chief Letney. We are hereby known that Apex Police Department, having fully demonstrated its voluntary commitment to law enforcement excellence by living up to a body of standards deemed essential to the, to the protection of the life, health, and safety of the rights of the citizens it serves, and having exemplified the best professional practices and the conduct of its responsibilities, is hereby, upon the recommendation of the members of the Commission, awarded this certificate of advanced accreditation, effective on the 26th day of July 2017, and is recognized as an accredited law enforcement agency for a period of four years. Thank you, Mr. Parrish, and uh, also please pass along my thanks to the CALEA staff who continue to assist us in this process. Since our assessment, we believe the accreditation process could be used as a management tool to provide a proven system for achieving a level of efficiency that can be measured, assessed, and maintained. During our first period of accreditation, we found it to be just that. It has become a blueprint to ensure that the Apex Police Department is at the forefront of the best practices in our profession that we achieve the level of professionalism and service delivery we're capable of and maintain that level as the needs of our rapidly growing community change. We are proud to be able to provide assurance to our community that the Apex Police Department meets and in many cases exceeds the professional standards of law enforcement. And we're honored to be among the few accredited agencies in North Carolina, 54 to be exact, which is roughly 6% of the total law enforcement agencies. The achievement takes a great deal of work to develop policies and procedures and ensure that we show we're in compliance with all applicable standards. While it is the accomplishment of all department employees, as well as other town departments and our significant partners such as CAPA, Sergeant Matt Kutcher, our accreditation manager, was responsible to spearhead those efforts. I would like to thank him for his efforts and present this certificate of achievement from CALEA to Sergeant Kutcher. Thank you.
Thank you, Chief. At this time, we move into the consent agenda. Consent agenda are items that are considered to be routine. Uh, they're typically enacted by a single motion. Uh, any council member, if they so choose, can pull something for a later discussion, but they're typically considered to be non-controversial items in a matter of course. At this time, I'll ask the council if there's an item that they would like to pull for a later discussion or if there is a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve. I'll second. All right, motion and the second to approve. Any further discussion on that motion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, this is the time where we set the regular meeting agenda. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, point out the only thing I'm aware of, which is that public hearing number two has been withdrawn by the uh, original requester. And at this time, um, it's my understanding that no action from the council is required. Is that correct, Lori? Right. Okay. So public hearing number two will not happen tonight. Um, other than that, let me just ask the council uh, if there are any other items that need to be shifted or if I could have a motion to approve the agenda with that one change. Um, I would like to add something to old business, please. Um, the, I would like to add... Um, an update on the Tungsten House Task Force. Is there any objection? Any other items? Is there a motion? Can I make the motion? We approve. All right, with the with the two items. Yes. All right, any discussion on that? All in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed say no. All right, the meeting agenda is set. We now move into public hearing number one. Uh, this time the town clerk is collecting the uh, yellow sheets. Uh, so hopefully if you intended to speak on an item, you've signed up. Uh, public hearing number one, this is a possible motion for Horton Park, number CZ, 17CZ19, and Amanda Bunce is presenting. Good evening. 17 CZ 19 uh, is a proposed rezoning of about 150 acres located on the north of the terminus, current terminus of Jesse Drive. Um, Smith Road is located here. It, so it does touch Smith Road in a small portion of this location. And just north of uh, Colby Chase, the Marion subdivision and Pemberley uh, subdivision. The property is heavily wooded uh, and is bisected by a couple of streams in the Colonial Gas Pipeline. The current zoning of the property is RA on the north side and rural residential on the south. The proposed rezoning includes two zoning districts. The northern parcel, um, larger parcel to be rezoned, is requested for light industrial conditional zoning and is not a part of the PUD, which is the remainder of the quest, request for this parcel and then the remainder of this pinkish area, um, which is proposed for planning and development conditional zoning. The 2030 land use map designates the majority of the property as medium density residential, noted in this light yellow area. The parcel to the north is uh, designated as office employment industrial employment, as is the majority of this parcel. Uh, this smaller parcel on the north side of Jesse Drive is designated as high density residential currently and finally this parcel is designated as medium high density residential. One parcel, this parcel here, is proposed for a 2030 land use map amendment. This um, portion of the property on the western end which is 1.92 acres is proposed to change to office employment industrial employment and the remainder of the parcel, which is 20.75 acres, is proposed to change to high density residential. The applicant conducted their neighborhood meeting on March 22nd, and you have that report in your packet. 
So I'm going to summarize the um, uses that are proposed first. Pod 1, which is the LICZ portion, um, has a long list of proposed uses, which I will highlight a few. Um, first of all, it is about 27.92 acres in size. Some of the uses are vet clinic, repair services limited, medical office, office business or professional, retail sales, automotive um, shop, body shop, automotive service station, repair and maintenance general, warehousing, wholesaling general, manufacturing and processing. They, there is also an architectural condition that uh, ethos, cornices, and parapet, parapet trim may be used and that ephus and stucco shall not be used within four feet of the ground and limited to no more than 25% of each building facade. Now I'm going to move into the portion of the uh, property proposed for the PUD. May, may I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah, right now, <coughs> right below the blue, uh, it, it shows the same color as what they want for the high density. I didn't think that was high density or that um, one right there. There is a, if you'll notice, pod four has a hatched pattern on it. Okay. So while it is the same color, the hatch mark is the distinguishing feature there. Okay, so the one right below the blue is still um, medium density? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> okay, in pod two, this is proposed to be a TechFlex non-residential pod. It is... Um, about 19.06 acres in size, and I'll highlight a few of the uses that are proposed. Daycare facility, vet clinic, vocational school, in, entertainment indoor, restaurant general, medical office, office professional, research facility, convenience store, grocery, pharmacy, repair services limited, microbrewery. <coughs> the maximum height proposed in pod two is 48 feet. Okay, going to I'll talk about pods. Uh, I'll talk about pod four next. Pod four is proposed for multifamily apartment use, townhouse town, or townhouse detached, um, also recreation facility private. Uh, as a highlight of the uses there, the uh, that is that pod is 20.99 acres in size. The maximum density proposed in that pod is, um, if developed as apartments, 314 apartment units, which is 15 dwelling units per acre. Um, and the maximum building height would be 65 feet or four stories, not including any basement level. What was the height? I'm sorry. Uh, 65 feet 65 or feet. four stories, which would not include a basement level. <coughs> If developed as townhomes, there would be a maximum of 125 townhomes, which is a maximum of six dwelling units per acre, and the maximum building height would be uh, 40 feet. In pods three and five, the proposed uses are single family, uh, townhouse, townhouse detached, recreation facility, private. Um, parks are also a, pr a proposed use in, in, in the residential pods. Um, if developed as <coughs> single fam, excuse me, through all the pods, if developed as townhomes, the maximum density is six dwelling units an acre. If developed as single family, the maximum single family density is four dwelling units per acre. So in pod three, which is about four and a half acres in size, the maximum would be 27 townhomes or 18 single family homes. In pod five, the maximum would be 118 townhomes or 78 single family homes. Um, for townhomes, there are two types of townhomes that are proposed, a type one and a type two, which is permitted, proposed in uh, pods three, four, and five, and those are front loaded and rear loaded uh, townhomes. Is, for, there any, is there any requirement for either one? There is not a requirement for either one um, for, for the townhomes. It's an option. Okay. Thank you. For single family, there are four types of single family um, products that are proposed. And those, basically, the main difference is the lot width, minimum lot width, which the four types are 70 foot, 60 foot, 50 foot and 40 foot wide product. Within um, 
There is a limitation for the 40 foot wide product known as Type S4 that any front entry units may have a one car garage or no garage for each unit. Uh, rear entry units may have um, a two car garage for each unit. Is there a limitation on how many no car garages units they can have? There is no limitation on that. The UDO allows parking to be met either in surface parking or in garage or driveway parking. Yeah. Um, so it can be handled um, through one or, or a mixture. I understand. I just thought they might have limits on what number of no car, no uh, garage. No, they, okay. there's no maximum okay. set. In pods six, seven, and eight, these are all designated as single family um, pods. So the total of those three pods is um, just under 57 acres, and the maximum between those three pods would be 227 single family lots. That's a density of four dwelling units per acre. In pod eight, which is at the southern end of the uh, development, there is a limitation that the S4, the smallest lot product, would not be permitted within that, that um, pod. Within pods six and seven, the S4 uh, or 40 foot wide product would only be permitted along the collector streets. Um, so, and then that means they would be rear loaded. <coughs> this um, graphic, I'll, let's see, I'm gonna go to this chart which highlights the buffers. For the most part, the buffers are the same as what's required by the UDO. There are instances where a greater buffer than what is required by the UDO is proposed. And then I've noticed if there's um, a difference, I've noticed that in italics underneath the proposed buffer type. This is on page seven of your staff report. You can probably see it better than, than on the screen. Um, and there are, <coughs> six areas where the buffer type is, has proposed to be reduced and primarily that is the parcels that are adjacent to the closed sorrel landfill and so generally speaking that buffer is about half of what's proposed which is permitted by the, the UDO. Um, and then along this western boundary of pod two uh, the uh, Required buffer type isn't known until the uses are developed. And so based on the intensity of the uses that actually develop there, and so um, that's noted, it's either the same or about half of what's required by the UDO. And again, that just depends. Yeah, I thought on the UDO that <coughs> for uh, residential, we pushed for type A. And I noticed that there's a lot of type D buffers. Well, the type, D, the type D's are along the collector streets yes. where the product is rear loaded. Okay, it has to be rear loaded then. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, there are instances where a type A has proposed to be reduced to a type B. There's a lot of existing vegetation mm -hmm. um, in this area um, to consider with that. Uh, generally speaking, along the, the streets, we have the type 10 foot type A buffer, uh, but there is a note that where there is a rear loaded product, it can, the opacity can be reduced to a, a 10 foot buffer. And then there is a 20 foot type B buffer along the southern boundary of this east west collector street that increases to 30 feet in this section along the Beck property. The required amount of RCA for this for the PUD is 20%, which it, the applicant has provided. In addition, uh, they have stated that they will provide the additional percent in any single family section that is mass graded, and that's consistent <coughs> with the UDO. Just to review the, uh, some of these, this is a highlight of the single family elevations that are proposed. And generally speaking, the elevations are con the architectural standards are consistent with um, our standard conditions requiring a raised foundation of 20 inches. The garage cannot protrude more than one foot out from the front facade or front porch. Eaves shall project at least 12 inches from the wall of the structure, requiring a varied color palette and requiring front porches be a minimum of six feet deep. For townhomes, again, a lot of our typical um, architectural standards that we see having a raised foundation of at 
least 12 inches. Roof line cannot be a single mass. It must be broken up horizontally or vertically between units. The garage cannot protrude more than one foot out from the front facade, a varied color palette, and side entry end unit townhomes in highly visible locations shall provide a covered entry feature for each unit. So in the case of the, this elevation where this is a side entry unit, there will have to be a um, covered entry feature added to the side. Um, okay, and for the apartments, again, typical of what we've seen, um, we'll note that where there is a four-story product, these breezeways will be enclosed because there will be elevators provided. So that would not be an open, open air. Did the planning board ask to have those taken out or something, the breezeways? Well, they did. The, um, the con there is a condition that has been added to that effect. Yeah. Breezeways for the four-story apartment elevation is to be enclosed for additional mechanical equipment or elevators. Right. <coughs> okay. This is a very detailed report, so I want to make sure I go through this carefully. The Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Advisory Commission met um, on August 30th for this project, and um, they did recommend a uh, fee in lieu. However, I want to get back to a map just to illustrate this. The Middle Creek Greenway Corridor runs very close to this um, project, and the property sits at the western edge of the southeast land acquisition area. That's why the fee in lieu was recommended for this project. The staff would like the flexibility to continue working with the developer to find a way to connect the Middle Creek Greenway in the event that a solution can be reached, the developer um, would construct that and um, receive credit against fees owed. Our bond is supposed to, that's one of the things on the bond, right, is the Middle Creek Greenway? I believe it is, yes. So, so if there was a portion of the project greenway that could be constructed as part of their development, then they would receive credit for against the fees owed. Okay. Uh, so water, of course, will be extended to this um, from multiple directions. For sewer, the developer will have to construct a pump station. It would be the Middle Creek North Pump Station located <coughs> generally in this location on the north side of Colby Chase. This pump station will be fully funded by the development team and then reimbursed through separate developers' agreements. How, how many gallons per day is this development going to use? Do you have any idea? I do not have the answer to that question. The engineer may. Okay. And presumably this is going to use the old sewer treatment plant, not the old one, not, not the new one. That's correct. Mill Creek, yes. Mill Creek yes. one. <coughs> okay. So now we're going to move into the um, traffic portion of the report. Before we do, Amanda, could I ask one couple more questions? I'm sorry. Medium density versus high density. What is the density of, of I'm sorry, uh, medium high density versus high density? So we had medium high density there, and they want high density. Yes. So in the 2030 land use plan, medium high density is capped at 14 dwelling units per acre. The applicant is requesting 15. So the cap for high density residential in the 2030 land use plan is 20 dwelling units yeah. per acre. So really they're just asking for that one dwelling unit per acre addition than what the medium high would permit. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna summarize. Um, staff had uh, several uh, traffic capacity zoning conditions recommended for the PUD. The applicant has added all of those conditions to their PUD document. And I'm going to highlight these. There are a lot of road improvements um, off-site um, that are required. So I'm going to just go through these very quickly. Um, there will be studying um, traffic signal timing modifications if necessary at the uh, US 1 uh, Center Street Waterford Green Drive area. Um, constructing turn lanes. Um, I'm going to go back. Sorry, I think using a map would be. Oh, that doesn't show it. Um, constructing uh, turn lanes at uh, US 1 ramps, um, providing an additional through lane and uh, merge length at 1010 and Reliance. Uh, at 1010 and Jesse, there would be turn lanes basically at every part of that existing intersection. 
and monitoring that intersection for a traffic signal. To highlight some of the other improvements, the developer will be constructing um, this east-west major collector street, um, generally in the location of where DeZola connects to Smith Road now. Um, this north-south uh, major collector is another road that the developer will be constructing. Um, the Jesse Drive right-of-way, um, additional right-of-way width will be dedicated and road improvements uh, made along Jesse Drive. Um, at East William Street and Stray White, which is off this map actually, down up at Miramont, that intersection will be monitored for a traffic signal if warranted. And then the developer shall construct the connection of Colby Chase Drive from the Pemberley subdivision to the Marion subdivision and connect the north-south collector street to Colby Chase. The phasing in the PUD, um, the, in the PUD document it specifies eight pods, which there are, as you see on this map, but it also specifies they could be developed in any order depending upon market conditions. Road improvements will, be, will factor into that phasing as well. The PUD also pro provides two options for residential development restrictions. <coughs> So essentially this is a phasing. There's a major concern about the impact on the roadways, the timing of the 1010 road improvements. As you know, the state has a TIP project to widen 1010 road, um, but the start of that project is not until 2023, which was in the TIA the anticipated build-out date for this development. So there was concern among staff and others uh, that this project could potentially be built out before that road project even began. So the developer has agreed to a phasing um, a series of development restrictions based on phasing of road improvements. So the first phase would be no more than 200 lots shall be platted for single family and townhomes or permits for apartment units or any combination thereof prior to the completion of the off-site road improvements identified within the traffic study and noted in section 12 of the PUD text. This also includes the construction of the north-south collector from Jesse Drive to Colby Chase Drive the Chol Colby Chase connection from Marion to Pemberley, and the portion of the east-west major collector from the north-south collector to the access for the DeZola Street properties. So it's 200 units um, at the point that all of those road improvements are done. The next phase is that no more than 100 additional residential lots or apartment units can be constructed prior to the completion of additional through lanes associated with the 1010 widening project. So essentially 300 units until the 1010 project is completed. And then phase three, all remaining residential lots shall not be platted for single family or townhomes or apartment units until the Jesse Drive extension from Highway 55 to 1010 Road has been let for construction. So option two, is if Jesse Drive from Highway 55 to 1010 Road is a two-lane roadway is completed, then all lots and units within Horton Park would be released for development. Um, none of these um, development restrictions apply to the non-residential portion of the PUD. So option two doesn't matter on 1010 Road, <laughs> only Jesse Drive. Right, because then people will have um, full opportunity to get to 55, which then they could get onto US-1. If they're using 1010 to get to US-1, they would be able to use Jesse Drive to get to US-1 as well um, and also get to, to 55. So that's a, that's a significant connection um, that needs to be made. I, I have a question. I think it's probably maybe for our town manager or for construction management. Once the contract is let for Jesse, drive extension to 55, mm -hmm. then these houses can be built. The question I have is, how long does it take to, would it take to construct Jesse Drive across that wetland versus how long, I mean, they can get their houses up in three months. If it takes a year or better to get that Jesse Drive in, then there's nine months of chaos. That's one of my concerns. Yeah. Mr. Dalton, about, about, about a year for construction. So it would take wouldn't about a year. let it until the, you know all the property acquisition design is done, but it'll take about a year to construct that. Thank you. 
So we would not release the um, the plats, which means they would not be able to get building permits for those until the um, they wouldn't be able to start be begin to construct those until the contract was let. The road was let. I understand. <coughs> the concern I have is that you can build a house a whole lot faster than you can build a road. So there's a timing situation there that maybe needs to be adjusted so that it's half built or something like that so that everything comes together at the same time. That's that's a concern. Thank you. Okay. So um, in conclusion, um, planning staff is recommending approval of the proposed 2030 land use map amendment on 5101 Jesse Drive from medium high density residential <coughs> to high density residential and office employment, industrial employment, and, in, and also recommending approval of the proposed rezoning to LICZ and PUDCZ as proposed by the applicant. The planning board at, at the October 9th meeting um, did recommend approval by a vote of six to one um, with the conditions as offered by the applicant, including an added condition to correct the buffers to meet um, the section referenced um, here in the report of the UDO and those corrections were uh, made which actually resulted in an increase in buffer width in certain locations. Approval of the land use map amendment is in keeping with the uh, future land use classifications to the north and west of the subject um, properties and with the town council stated goal of increasing the amount of land available for non-residential uses. With the approval of the proposed change to the land use map, the requested rezoning to PUDCZ um, would be consistent with said map. Um, the requested portion to LICZ is already consistent with the 2030 land use map. With the modifications made to the text since the September 11th planning board meeting, the rezoning is reasonable and in the public interest for the following reasons. The rezoning sets residential development restrictions that are tied to off-site road improvements the construction of internal collector streets, and the construction of improvements on 1010 Road and or Jesse Drive. This ensures that the project is not built out prior to the substantial completion of significant roadway improvements that will mitigate the project's impact on the surrounding community. The rezoning proposes nearly 47 acres of non-residential zoning that will provide employment opportunity, opportunities and office and retail uses to support the immediate and surrounding neighborhoods. This will also help to improve the tax base for the town of Apex. And finally, the rezoning provides for a variety of residential uses and product types that are appropriate based on the location and context of each within the PUD. I'll be happy to answer any additional questions that you may have. I have a couple of questions. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't feel like our townhouse developments, maybe you can get this answer for me, have been six units an acre. I feel like they've been less than that. Maybe you could look at some recent townhouse units that we've approved. Um, there have been some that are less. Sometimes we see them along the lines of five or five and a half um, dwelling units per acre. It really depends if it's mixed in an overall project that has single family or if it's just townhomes. Um, so and this would this is basically setting their maximum number of units. What they're actually able to achieve once they start laying out the subdivision plan that may that number may <coughs> go down. So do you know off the top of your head the development of, across from Salem Baptist Church, I believe is a 100% townhouse development, what that density was? Um, that would be the towns at North Salem. I do not know. I can look that up for you um, and have that, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. All right, and the second question. I made a, a comment um, about a year ago when um, Mr. Whitehead's project was approved connecting Colby Chase about traffic going through there. What's our plan with calming traffic, four-way stop, a, a traffic circle? Um, I believe uh, Russell could answer that question <coughs> better than I, any type of traffic calming measures at Colby Chase and the North-South Collector intersection. <coughs> what I understand in the subdivision plan review, uh, they've proposed a traffic circle, a mini circle. Um, so we're uh, we're fine with that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I have a, a it is. It is actually. I, I, well, I just, Go ahead. Is there any other questions on that, or? <coughs> Good. While, right. while you're here, <laughs> uh, the uh, Colby Chase folks are concerned about 
keeping Colby Chase closed. Is that is that in this? Are we keeping Colby Chase closed until um, until the connection to uh, from uh, I forget the name of the street now, Darby or something like that is made. Uh, at this time, we don't have that, but it'd be up to the applicant to offer that um, condition. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I, I have I have another. I, I'll be glad to wait if you guys want to. I, I have at least uh, one more. Maybe being as you're a traffic uh, engineer slash planner, <laughs> um, the pod pod one, the purple. I'm, I'm concerned personally that this really isn't in the plan unit development. I've seen this before. The, the developer doesn't have a lot of control. Yeah, they rezone it to what it should be rezoned to, but then nothing happens. Uh, the, but the one concern I have here is we have a stub from uh, Pinnacle Park coming down almost due north of this point. In this traffic development or traffic plan, it seems to me that we should require some sort of a dedication of a right-of-way through that property in some place so that we can stub out to where the cash property is just north and eventually make that connection. And the reason I'm asking is because we want to make this live work and there's an opportunity to connect this thing directly, eventually, to a real uh, business park um, and not have the people get out on 1010. I mean, it's not going to be a huge impact, but some of those people that are living there can work in Pinnacle Park or as the uh, cash property develops possibly, and we need that connection. And, and I think that should be in this plan at this point if they want to play the game of that's going to be part of their deal. And as I'm seeing it, I guess Amanda would have to clarify that from the north shown in that plan. Right. So shown it. on our transportation plan, there is um, a street generally in this location. In fact, this property has already dedicated half of the right-of-way. Mm -hmm. So this alignment would be worked out at the time of site plan, mm -hmm. and at that time um, they would have to um, – we would deal with the road at the time of site plan, uh, getting right-of-way dedication and that portion constructed since it is on our transportation plan. Since it's not part of that LICZ area, is not part of the PUD, it's not shown here. The, it's, mm -hmm. This PUD yeah. is just being shown for illustration purposes only, um, but that would be required to happen at the time of site plan um, approval. And the problem I have is when is site plan going to be because it, <coughs> the developer doesn't have any control over this. Once again, it's it's a little sure. bit like Friendship Station. But in the same turn, if it were a part of the PUD, it could develop last. Well, we don't we, know the timing of when it would develop. If it was part of the PUD, though, we could require a phasing of some sort to at least get that road in, I believe. That's that's a big concern for me. It, it can't be part of the PUD because most of the uses in LI are not allowed in PUD. Okay, that's fine, but how do, we, how do we ensure that we get roadway connectivity ready as this thing develop, builds out? I, I'm really troubled by that. Okay. Any other questions for staff? I do have a question for Amanda. The, lo the loan vote against this on the planning board to give reasons? Um. I can answer that. It was Mr. Mead, and he was mainly concerned about the timing of road construction, um, both for the time of construction when vehicles would be coming through the neighborhood. Um, the several neighborhoods, actually, it would be coming through Pemberley, Miramont, and Marion, and he was concerned about that, uh, particularly the county streets being impacted since we don't have any control to maintain or um, fix them if something happened. Um, and he was also concerned um, about just the timing of which roads would be done when and mainly concerned, he is the ETJ representative and mainly concerned about um, the ETJ neighbors. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? 
What is there any other gain on going to high density other than the extra one unit per acre? Uh, that's it. That that is it. Okay. And the other question I do have is um, Pod two is limited to 48 feet, which is non-residential, while the <laughs> apartments will co can go to 65 feet. Um, what's to why is the reasoning not to allow up to 65 feet so they can have a taller office? 48 feet is what the applicant um, Asked proposed. That's a potentially okay. a four-story um, office, office building. Okay, thank you. And to confirm, Pod 4 high density is in our zoning, and our UDO is 14 units an acre. They asked for 15. Uh, the current 2030 land use map designation has Pod 4 as medium high density residential, which is up to 14. They have requested that change to high density so that they could request 15 dwelling units an acre. And I do have the answer on the towns at North Salem townhome development was approved at 5.79 units per acre and that's actually what they're con that was approved on the PUD but it's also what they